Good morning, church. Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ in Vincennes, Indiana. Uh, whether you're here in the sanctuary or at home on Facebook Live, know that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. A special welcome today to visitors from the far-off kingdom of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Kay Pepmeyer and Kristen Leslie, we're glad you're here. I understand conversations are beginning about gleaning, so I guess it's uh, maybe spring is coming pretty soon. Who knows? Not today. Um, if you are here in sanctuary, please fill out the pew pads and send them back to the middle. If you're at home, please click the like button or uh, make a comment so we may know of your presence. Um, it's nice and cozy here in the sanctuary, not so much in other parts of the building. We're still working on uh, repairing of one of the boilers. Uh, we also uh, discovered that the ice machine and the dishwasher aren't working, so there's going to be taken care of as well, all thanks to that wonderful surge we had a week or so ago. Uh, calendar events today is one great hour of sharing Sunday, and uh, we'll be collecting that special all-church offering at the United Church of Christ. And uh, it, there is information in your bulletin as an announcement sheet as far as a, a little brochure as well as uh, information on the back of your bulletin so take take some time to read the back of your bulletin today um, worship committee and church board meet on Monday choirs on Wednesday and uh, always looking for new voices uh, technology meets on Thursday next Sunday there's a special Sunday school activity for all ages and uh, we're going to be preparing for the Easter egg hunt which will be coming up. You see there's an announcement on the announcement sheet about the Easter egg hunt as well, uh, probably about donations of candy and that kind of thing. And so there'll be uh, projects going on for that. And you'll see that in the announcements as well uh, on uh, next Sunday. Um, and remember the worship committee has requested potted spring flowers for decorating for the sanctuary for Easter. And you see the instructions about that. So please consider that. A busy week for uh, folks here at St. John's. We have uh, four folks who are having either surgeries or procedures. Uh, Vern Houchins, Peggy Meyer, Janet Goodman, and Dan Coulter. And we ask that we all, of course, extend our prayers this week for that all goes well for uh, four of our folks. Um, also, uh, prayers continue for Wally Linweber and family. I understand he got to go home. And so it'd be re, be, re, he'll be working on rehab and all that kind of stuff, stuff from home. That is a good thing. Pastor Linda and I would like to thank everyone for the prayers for our daughter, Sarah. Uh, her procedure went fine, and we're relieved that the pathology report did not show any malignancy. Uh, there will be follow-up conversations, though, about what all this means. Please continue to pray for those who are on the prayer list and all those who are homebound or living in health care facilities or assisted living facilities. Any announcements I missed? Any concerns we need to know about? If not, I invite all the to please rise and greet each other in the name of the Lord. Once we walked in darkness. Once we stumbled from blindness and self-righteousness. Once we were trapped in judgment and prejudice. Let us worship the God of grace and glory.
Together, let us pray. God of amazing grace, heal our blind spots. Give us the vision to see others as you see them. Give us your vision. We fear what we do not understand. When we bind us, when we cling to feelings of superiority, when we cannot see your healing in those of whom we think ill, touch us with your healing hands of love, free us from all blindness, and grant that we can see ourselves and others as we truly are. Hold us in your love and grace and open our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. seated.
seeing no children by age. <laughs> we'll skip the children's sermon this morning, but uh, this is a day in which we rejoice because we worship a God of abundance, a wonderful, generous God who calls us to be good stewards of what we have been given and to be generous in what we give. This is One Great Hour Sharing Sunday, and it's the first Sunday we'll be collecting. We'll be collecting next week as well. But this is an opportunity of which we may give not only our regular offerings to the life of the church, but also to this all-church offering has special uses, particularly in areas of development and, and foreign ministry and, and these kinds of things. And you, the information we have shared, of course, throughout the years. Give, please give prayerful consideration to what your gift to one great hour sharing in particular might be this year. So as God's recipients of great and mighty gifts, may we come as God's stewards with our morning offering. If I all are able, please stand. Together, let us pray. Generous God, you anoint our heads with oil and our cups overflow. With your abundance, we do not take for granted all that you provide. Take these gifts and use them for the healing and tender care of your hurting world. May your cup of love overflow and abide with the hurting and the heartbroken, forgotten and despised so that we may all be made whole. Amen. You may be seated. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from the letter to the Ephesians, the fifth chapter, uh, beginning with the eighth verse. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of, of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and the Christ will shine on you. Our gospel lesson comes from the gospel of uh, John. Ninth chapter, beginning with the first verse. And just a little word of information. I think I misinformed you last week, because <laughs> I said that was the longest lesson we were going to have out of John's gospel this week and next week, I think, a little bit longer. So the ninth chapter of John. As he was walking along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind, so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is a day. Is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said, said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with a saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, 
Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying. It is he. Others were saying. Oh, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying. I am the man. But they kept saying. Then how were your eyes opened? He answered. Ah, the man called Jesus made mud, spread, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? The man said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and when I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, Well, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened? He said, He's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, oh, We know that he is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though, is I was blind, and now I see. They said to him, well, What did he do to you? How did you, he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already. You would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but, but as for this man, well, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from? And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but, does, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for, judge, for judgment so that those who do not see me see and those who see me may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. May our God bless this story to our hearts and lives.
Let us pray. Gracious God, touch our hearts and touch the heart of each individual here. Touch them with your love, with your grace, and grant them that which they need for this day and all days. And touch our hearts that they might be filled to overflowing with your love and with your grace. Amen. I want to spend just a little time doing an overview of where we've been and where we might be going here during uh, our journey through the Gospel of John this Lenten season. As you remember, the first Sunday of Lent began with Jesus' journey in the wilderness. That story came to us out of gospel, the Gospel of Matthew. The journey in the wilderness is always, if you're following the lectionary, from one of the three synoptic gospels for the first Sunday in Lent. But here in the month of March, we've entered into the Gospel of John, turning to John's words, John's stories for these Sundays of March. Many scholars believe that the Gospel of John is based on what is called a signs document. As you look through the Gospel, you will find scattered throughout there different signs that Jesus did. Signs that are to witness to Jesus. Signs that are to witness to Jesus' glory. When you look at the synoptic gospels, the other three gospels, a lot of times the miracles that happen there or the healings are kind of private events. But here what John is doing is trying to make sure 
everybody sees this. Everybody sees what Jesus is doing. Some scholars say that there's like seven, maybe eight signs, distinct signs in the gospel. And I want to just go through those very briefly. If you want to turn to your Bibles, I will tell you the chapter that those are in. And you can, you can skim through there and see some of those highlights of the signs. The first sign is Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. So that celebration might go on. They were worried about running out of wine and running out of good wine. So Jesus joins in the fellowship and turns water to wine. And John tells us that is Jesus' first sign that has revealed his glories and that the disciples believed him. Turning over to the fourth chapter of John, we learn about the healing of the royal official's son. A second sign that Jesus did after coming um, into Judea, from Judea into Galilee. In the fifth chapter of John, we learn about the healing of a man born lame. This man had been lame for something like 38 years, and he had been laying by the sheep gate pool off and on for all of those years. Well, one day he's there and Jesus comes by. Jesus sees him and Jesus asks him a question. Man, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be able to walk? Well, of course, that's what he's been waiting on for all of those many, many long years. So Jesus calls to him, tells him to stand up to take his mat and walk. And this man, who hasn't been able to function by himself to walk around, is freed. Freed from that which had held him back. And this is another sign giving witness to Jesus and giving glory to God. Then in John 6, we hear about the feeding of the 5,000. We are told that when the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this indeed is a prophet who has come into the world. So it's kind of like these signs are building on top of each other. And the more people see, the more they begin to see a little bit deeper who Jesus is and begin to accept him as the Messiah of God. In another story in John 6, we hear about another sign, and that is Jesus walking on the water. Next, we turn to today's story. The healing of a man born blind, and this story takes up most of the part of the ninth chapter of John's Gospel. And finally, in a story we will encounter next week from the 11th chapter of John, we hear the story of the raising of Lazarus. Now, you have to start at the end of John's Gospel, at the very end, chapter 20 of John's Gospel, to learn what those signs are about. There it is that you kind of find John's purpose statement. This is the reason I'm writing this way. This is why these are signs that I have included in my Gospel. John 20, verse 30 says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may, be, may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Last week or so I talked about 
so many of these stories kind of being custom-made stories in John's gospel. It's not just one pattern for everybody. It's, it's the uniqueness of the individual. It's the uniqueness of the situation. And what we see is, well, I would say we see, is faith is a journey. These people see Jesus' signs. Maybe they experience him, and then they grow a little bit in their faith. And then they grow a little bit more. And then they grow more. And then they are ready to testify to who Jesus is. A journey of faith. And we are all on that journey, aren't we? Sometimes it's going smoother for us than other times. Sometimes we've got some bumps. Sometimes we've got some hills to climb on our journey. But we keep on the journey knowing that others have gone before us and that Jesus and the God of Jesus Christ go with us. Now today's story, the story of the man born blind, blind from the day of his birth. We think about blindness and blindness in this world. Fortunately, there are areas where it's not as common, but still way too common anywhere. A report that gave data from the World Health Organization from October 2021 reported that there were 284 million people in the world who were visually impaired. That's some of you and me sitting here. But there are 39 million people who are blind. And the astonishing thing about that, the heartbreaking thing about that, is the report says it is possible to say that 60% of the blindness in the world can be cured, and 20% can be prevented. Enormous, amazing. Through the Gospel of John, we find a characteristic interweaving of theology and story. Like we saw in the story of Jesus and Nicodemus when Nicodemus came to Jesus there the first time at night, and by the end of the gospel, he's out in broad daylight ministering to Jesus. Story, like we saw the interweaving of theology and story with Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. And here again today, drama unfolds before us. We can almost see those encounters of long ago. The characters teaching us lessons along life's journey of faith. And the marvelous stories invite us to enter, not just as onlookers from far away, but invite us to enter as participants in the here and now. Where are we in those stories? Who are we in those stories? How do we see ourselves in those stories? The stories invite us to see ourselves in a new perspective and to meet Jesus once again anew and fresh and to learn from watching him and listening to him. There are so many remarkable and refreshing stories that touch the heart. To see the way in which Jesus deals with people in unconventional, non-traditional ways. There is definitely a vivid contrast between the way Jesus deals with people and the way the religious authorities deal with people. And I think we want to keep that phrase in mind. It's Jesus in a contrast with the religious authorities. It isn't simply Jesus and the, and the Jews over here, 
because Jesus and his followers were still Jews. This is a scuffle between the religious authorities, the people who saw themselves having the power and the control, and the other people, the people who saw themselves as the keepers and the watcher, watchers for the law. As Jesus and his disciples are walking along, Jesus sees this man who has been born blind. His disciples ask Jesus a question. It is a question based in the theological, religious assumptions of that day. Who is it that sinned? Because sin has to be involved. Either this man's parents sinned or this infant sinned to cause him to be born blind. It was a question a lot of people had on their mind in this story in that day and all too often today. If there is illness, if there is calamity, if there is tragedy, it has to be God punishing someone for something, especially if God likes our theological view, but we're not quite sure God likes somebody else's theological view. There has to be something when we know that God approves of what we do, but doesn't approve of the people in a fire ravaged, flooded, or earthquake destroyed land. Surely there's this thing about right and wrong, and we're on the side of right. But Jesus doesn't buy into that kind of theological thinking, legalistic thinking, nor the God represented by such an understanding. That is not the God of Jesus Christ. God's, Jesus says that neither the parents nor the man born blind sinned. Here in this event, in this tragedy for this man and for his parents, What's going to be worked out in Jesus' view is that God's glory is going to be shown. We're going to see God working good in this, not trying to punish these people, but working for the good of all. This is the way things are in God's glory is going to be seen through it. A long time ago, years and years ago, I saw kind of a Talking Heads video, one of the, I think it was one of the Living Questions series, and a phrase in that has stuck with me every, ever since that I think applies to this. And the person said, I try not to get God and life mixed up. Try not to get God and life mixed up. Some things happen in life. That doesn't mean God is out to get you. Jesus, who is light of the world in John's gospel, will bring light into this situation too, with this man who's never seen light in his life. As Jesus stands before this man, can't you just see the scene? Can't you just see Jesus bending down, maybe wiping his hand in the dirt, then spitting, big spit here, making some mud, making that mud and putting it on the man's eyes, perhaps not the kind of medicinal treatment I'd be up for right now. 
but a standard kind of treatment for that day. A little word about that spit, the medicinal spit. Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, way back in 23 to 79 AD, wrote that diseases could be cured by fasting saliva, which the article explains is saliva in the morning before breakfast. Among the diseases that might be helped, he said, with the early morning application of fasting spittle are eye diseases. They might be cured by that. Now apparently, in the article I read, not apparently, I read it, so apparently it's happening, modern microbiologists have turned their attention and their experiments to the half gallon of our saliva that's generated each day. We don't swallow our saliva when we are asleep, hence fasting saliva. And there is something in it they say, that might help protect our body against infectious diseases and foreign invaders. Did you notice Jesus' preconditions for this man's healing? The man is simply sitting there, probably begging the way he has his entire life, hoping for a handout so he could make it one more hour, so he could make it one more day, maybe have a meal that day. Sitting there in need. And Jesus reaches out, embraces him with healing grace, and sets him on a journey of seeing the world. Jesus saw the man through divine eyes with divine sight. You would think people would be rejoicing. Wouldn't we all be cheering here if one of our friends who had been born blind could all of a sudden see? But not everyone is happy about this situation. The religious authorities aren't happy. Once again, Jesus is violating, blatantly violating, the rules of the Sabbath. Once again, Jesus is bringing one they view as a sinner into the realm of God's presence. Once again, Jesus is violating the way nature and the world, and above all, God, should work. Is this really the man who was born blind or just a lookalike? The neighbors question him. Are you really the one? What's happened? How is it that he can see? Others continue to question. The questions go on. The questions are repeated. The man's getting exhausted as a series of interrogations continue, questioning him about he, how he had received his sight. The man answers, tells them what happened. There's no rejoicing over the reality that a blind man can now see. Jesus, the sinner, couldn't have done this because he broke God's rules. But the man realizes something deeper about Jesus and says that he's a prophet. His understanding is growing in this faith journey. The parents are interrogated. Yeah, this is our son, but he's of age, so go ask him and find out what he says because they too are being afraid of this expulsion from the synagogue. So they go to the man a second time, a third time. And the man answers, I don't know whether Jesus is a sinner or not, but one thing I do know, that I was blind and now I can see. When the man born blind is pressured again to say what has happened, he says that he's already told them, I've already told you. And he says to them, what? Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become Jesus' followers? And I just love that line. 
There is humor in there in that line. There is sarcasm. There is a taunt. I can just imagine that they weren't pleased with his little taunt. I always detect the humor as they question him. They defend their position. No, we are Moses' disciples. Gail R. O'Day, who was a professor of preaching in New Testament at Candler the School of Theology and author of the New Interpreter's Bible commentary on John, says that in John's Gospel, faithfulness to grace and truth available in Jesus, not faithfulness to the law, is a decisive mark of true discipleship. The religious folk are not pleased with what is going on. So they pronounce judgment on the man calling him a sinner, kicking him out of the synagogue. And then Jesus goes and finds him. Goes and finds him. And talks with him. As he is professing who Jesus is. Now because there's this little thing going on between the religious authorities and the Jewish Christians who follow Jesus. Because there is a touch of anti-Semitism there. That does not mean there is any excuse at all for anti-Semitism in this day and age. This man has been excluded. And isn't that the way it too often is? If someone isn't on our team, God, they need to be excluded. Excluded in many ways. Excluded from a variety of activities. Excluded from opportunities. Excluded from so many rights that so many of us here and now take for granted. I was listening to a podcast about this text, and one of the people was talking about this exclusion that was going on here in the gospel. And she said, the fact is that the sin is this mechanism of exclusion. The people who do the expelling are the ones who think they have the moral authority who should be in and who should be out. For Jesus, that is the primary human sin, the exclusion. And she says, we always look for people to cast out and send away. Think they're doing it for the right reasons and that God is on their side. But that's not the case at all. I believe that one of the things this story does is ask us to look at our lives, to question ourselves, to be honest. Who do we exclude? How far do we exclude them? Do we just exclude to a certain point, and if it's only to that point, then hey, yeah, it's okay. They can be part of us. Or do we, do we push those boundaries farther and then a little bit farther and say, nope, they're excluded. We don't want them around. Who do we exclude? And where are our own blind spots. I know I've got blind spots. I've had them all my life and I'll probably continue to have them all my life. Perhaps there are blind spots that need further examination so that one day we don't fail to be sensitive and have a serious wreck on the highway of life, ruining our own lives or the life of someone else. The story ends with the reality that this man has come to believe in Jesus 
as a revelation of God's love and grace. And we hear Jesus' words. I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. We get both of a message of warning as well as a message of salvation and grace. The warning, I believe, is expressed for us in the words of someone who said, there are lots of Pharisees in our lives today. There always have been. By definition, they will be religious people. They are religious people who can't see. They are harder to reach than the unchurched. Why? They are so convinced that they are right and that others are wrong. They have no room for self-examination. But the message of salvation and grace for each of us comes from seeing in this story, as well as in other stories in John, the wide embrace of the God who comes among us, who listens to Nicodemus as he searches for deeper meaning in life, who engages a woman at a well in life-giving, non-judgmental conversation, who opens the eyes of a man born blind. God is attentive and cares for us, has a mission and a purpose, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey. In a few moments, we will sing the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. The story is that that hymn goes way, way back, the words to it. And the words were written by a person that they called the little blind one because he wasn't able to see. So think about that as you sing that story and as you read those words and think about your own life. Pray. God of grace and God of mercy, cast your light upon your people as we worship you this day. Shower us with your Holy Spirit, inspire us with the stories of Jesus, and empower us to follow in his way. We know that you are the God of healing. Heal us like Jesus healed the blind man. Open our eyes that we may see the hurt and the pain and needs of the world around us. Open our eyes that we may see the needs of those in our community, our neighbors who are homeless, who suffer from food insecurity, who are ill with no one to care for them, who are lonely and isolated. Open our eyes that we may see how we can use your, our church resources to the betterment of our community and of those who live within it. Open our eyes, O oh God, that we may recognize the aggressors in this world, those who are so exclusive of others, yet they claim it's what they say and what they do is for the betterment of the whole. Open our hearts to pour to your will and your way. Help us to be accepting to change, for the mo world is changing. Former rules, assumptions, and norms may not translate well in the world we live in. Help us to know that bettering this world is not found by returning to the past open our hearts and minds so that relationships that are broken might be mended. Oppression and wars might be ended. Spirals of addiction and depression might be upended. Bring hope to the hopeless. Bring wholeness to the broken. Love to the loveless. Bring sight to the blind and release the captives. 
continue to bless your people so we may become a ho- beacon of hope and a light upon the hill reaching out to every nook and cranny of an ever darkening world we ask these prayers in the name of your son who is the one who taught us to pray together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily forth knowing that you are God's holy and beloved children, that you are on a faith journey, and follow that journey in the way of Jesus day by day. Go, let God be your vision. Open your eyes to see yourself, to see others as God sees. And may the blessings of Almighty God, who creates and redeems and sanctifies, be with you this day and forever. Amen. Amen.